Welcome back to Van's Reading. We're on uh, part three now and uh, of Beyond an Order by Jordan Peterson. Yep, that's right. Look at that beautiful face right there, staring into the sunset, finding life's answers, etc. Huh. Anyway, let's begin. <clears throat> necessity of equals, the necessity of equals. It is good to be a beginner, but it's good but it is a good of a different sort to be an equal among equals. It is said with much truth that genuine communication can take place only between peers. This is because it is very difficult to move information up a hierarchy. Those well positioned, and this is a great danger of moving up, have used their current competence, their cherished opinion, <clears throat> their present knowledge, their current skills to stake a morale claim to their status. In consequence, they have little motivation to admit to error to learn or change, and plenty of reason not to. If a subordinate exposes the ignorance of someone with greater status, he risks humiliating that person questioning the, valid the validity oh, fuck this word again. with validity of the latter's claim to influence and status and revealing him as incompetent, outdated or false. For this reason, it is very wise to approach your boss, for example, carefully and privately with a problem and perhaps best to have a solution at hand and not one profit to incautiously. Barriers exist to the flow of genuine information down a hierarchy as well. For example, the resentment people lower in the chain of command might feel about their hypothetically lesser position can make them loathe to act productively on information from above. Or, in the worst case, can motivate them to work at counter purposes to what they have learned out of a sheer spite. In addition, those who are inexperienced or less educated or who newly occupy a subordinate position and therefore lack knowledge of their surroundings can be more easily influenced by relative position and the exercise of power instead of quality of argumentation and observation of competence. Peers, by contrast, must in the main be convinced. Their attention must be carefully reciprocated. To be surrounded by peers is to exist in a state of equality and to manifest the give and take necessary to maintain that equality. It is therefore good to be in the middle of a hierarchy. This is partly why friendships are so important and why they form so early in life. A two-year-old typically is self-concerned, although also capable of simple reciprocal actions, the same Scarlet whom I talked about earlier, my granddaughter, would happily hand me one of her favorite stuffed toys attached to a pacifier when I asked her to. Then I would hand it or toss it back. Sometimes she would toss it to me too, or at least relatively near me. She loved this game. We played it with a spoon as well and, imp and implement she was just beginning to master. She played the same way with her mother and her, grand and her grandmother with anyone who happened to be within playing distance if she was familiar enough with them not to be shy. This was the beginning of the behaviors that transformed themselves into full-fledged sharing among all the children. My daughter Michaela Scarlett's mother took her child to, out, to the outdoor recreational space on top of their downtown condo a few days before I wrote this. <clears throat> a number of other children were playing there, most of them older, and there were plenty of toys. Scarlett spent her time hoarding as many of the playthings as possible near her mother's chair and was distinctly unimpressed if other children came along to poor loin one for themselves. She even took a ball directly from, an, from a, another child to her collection. This is typically behavior for children two and younger. The ability to reciprocate while hardly absent and able to manifest itself in truly endearing ways is developmentally limited. By three years of age, however, most children are capable of truly sharing. They can delay gratification long enough to take their turn while playing a game that everyone cannot play simultaneously. They can begin to understand the point of the game played by several people and follow the rules. Although they may not be able to give a co coherent uh, verbal account of what those rules are, they start to form friendships upon repeated exposure to children with whom they have successively negotiated reciprocal play relationships. Some of these friendships turn into the first intense relationships that children have outside their family. It is the context of such relationships which tend, to, which tend strongly to form between equals in age, or at least equals in development stage. 
that a child learns to bond tightly to a peer and starts to learn how to treat another person properly while requiring the same in return. This mutual bonding is vitally important. A child without at least one special close friend is much more likely to suffer later psychological problems. Oh, that's, let me read that again. The mutual bonding is vitally important. A child with at least, without at least one special close friend is much more likely to suffer late psychological problems. Whether of the depressive slash anxious or antisocial sort, while, while children with fewer friends are also more likely to be unemployed and unmarried as adults. There is no evidence that the importance of friendship declines in any manner with age. He says here, this makes the July 30, 2019 poll from YouGov, Millennials are the loneliest generation, indicating that 25% have no acquaintances and 22% no friends, particularly ominous, ominous if true. <laughs> Thank God I have friends. I have friends. I have friends. No pressure. Guys. <laughs> All causes of mortality appear to be reduced among adults with high quality social networks, even when general health status is taken into consideration. This remains true among the elderly in the case of disease such as hypertension, diabetes, emphysema, and arthritis. Emphysema. I think that's what it is. could be asthma. I think it's asthma. Maybe it's asthma. No, it's not asthma because it says emphysema. Emphysema and arthritis. And for younger and older adults like alike in the case of heart attacks, interestingly enough, there is some evidence that is the provision of social support as much or more than its receipt that provides these protective, benef protective benefits and somewhat unsurprisingly that those who give more tend to receive more. Thus, it truly seems that it's better to give than to receive. Peers distri distribute both the burdens and joys of life. Recently, when my wife Tammy and I suffered serious health problems, we were fortunate enough to have a family member, my in-laws, sister and brother. My own mother and sister, our children and close friends stay with us and help for substantial periods of time. They were willing to put their own lives on hold to aid us while we were in crisis. Before that, when my book 12 Rules for Life became a success and during the extensive speaking tour that followed, Tammy and I were close to people with whom we could share our good fortune. These were friends and family members genuinely pleased with what was happening and following the event of our lives avidly and who were willing to discuss what could have been the overwhelming public response. This greatly heightened the significance and meaning of everything we were doing and reduced the isolation isolation that such a dramatic shift in life circumstances for better or worse is likely to produce. <clears throat> the relationships established with colleagues of similar status at work constitute another important source of peer regulation in addition to friendship. To maintain good relationships with your colleagues means among other things. To give credit where credit is due to take your fair share of the jobs no one wants but still must be done to be to deliver on time and in a high quality manner when teamed with other people to show up when expected and in general to be trusted to do somewhat more than your job formally requires. The approval or disapproval of your colleagues reward and enforces this continual recipro recipro reciprocity. Re I think it's re reciprocity. And that, like the reciprocity that is necessarily part of friendship helps maintain stable psychological function. It is much better to be to be someone who can be relied upon, not least so that during times of personal trouble, the people you have worked beside are willing and able to step in and help. Through friendship and collegial, collegial relationships, we modify our selfish Oh God, why are these words so difficult? God, through friendship and collegial relationships, we modify our selfish proclivities. I think it's proclivities. Learning not to always put ourselves first. Less obviously, but just as importantly, we may also learn to overcome our naive and too empathetic proclivities, our tendency to sacrifice ourselves unsuitably and unjustly to predatory others when our peers advise and encourage us to stand up for ourselves in consequence if we are fortunate we begin to practice true reciprocity and we gain at least reciprocity at, and we gain at least some of the advantage spoken about so famously by the poet robert burns oh what some power the gift he gives us to see ourselves as it is see us in what frame money Oh, that's a weird word. In what frame money a blunder free us 
and foolish notion what is in dress on gate white Lewis and own an un un devotion. What the hell did I just say? This is what it says here, people. I won't lie. Look at that. It's like weird words. Look at this. It's, these are not words. These are. This is old, you know, speaking language. I don't know what it is exactly. I think it's old English. Must be. Top dog. It is a good thing to be an authority. People are fragile. Because of that, life is difficult and suffering common. Am ameliorating. That's suffering, ensuring that everyone has food, clean water, sanitary facilities, and a place to take shelter for starters. Takes initiative, effort, and ability. If there is a problem to be solved and many people involve themselves in the solution, then a hierarchy must and will arise as those who can do and those who cannot follow as best they can, often learning to be competent in the process. If the problem is real, then people who are best at solving the problem at hand should rise to the top. That is not, the, that is not power. It is the authority that properly accompanies ability. Ooh, that's good. I like that. That is really good. That is really good. I really like that. Uh, if they saw in this one, equally appropriate to be one of those competent authorities, if possible, when there is a perplexing problem at hand, this might be regarded as a philosoph as a philosoph here of responsibility. Sorry, this might be regarded as a, as a philosophy of responsibility. A responsible person decides to make a problem his or her problem, and then works diligently, even ambitiously, for its solutions with other people in the most efficient manner possible. Efficient because there are other problems to solve and efficiency allows for the conversation, no, sorry, allows for the conservation of resources that might then be devoted importantly elsewhere. Okay, I do like that. The fact is that he's trying to say, is, okay, you need to take, if you can solve the problem, you need to take responsibility for it. And therefore, figure it out on the, as the way as you go if you are capable of doing it, which does make sense. Kind of relate to this a lot. It's happened quite a few times to me. <laughs> but what's interesting is that he, he has a point there that we become extremely ambition, ambitious to do these things, right? And the question is, how does one know if he's capable or not? Is he because he's taking the responsibility or... How certain is he to, you know, to be responsible? Like how that's, we'll find out now. <clears throat> Ambition is often and often purposefully misidentified with the desire for power and damned with faint praise and denigr or denigrated and punished. And ambition is sometimes exactly that wish for uh, undue influence on others. But there is a crucial difference between sometimes and always. Authority is not mere power. And it is extremely unhelpful, even dangerous to confuse the two. When people exert power over others, they compel them forcefully. They apply the threat of, of, of privation or, or punishment. So they're subordinates and have little choice but to act in a manner contrary to their personal needs, desires and values. When people wield authority, by contrast, they do so because of their competence. A competence that is spontaneously recognized and appreciated by others and generally followed willingly with a certain relief and with the sense that justice is being served. Those who are power hungry, tyrannical and cruel, even psychopathic desire control over others so that they, so that every selfish whim of hedonism, hedonism can be immediately gra gra gratified so that envy can destroy its target, so that resentment can find its expression. But good people are ambitious and diligent, honest and focused along with it. Instead, because they are possessed by the desire to solve genuine, serious problems. Facts. Facts. All right. Now we're getting some. That variant of ambition needs to be encouraged in every possible manner. It is for the reason, among many others, that the increasingly reflexive identification of, of the striving of boys and men for victory with the Patriarch oh fucking I hate this word patriarchal patriarchal tyranny that hypothetically characterizes our modern productive and comparatively free societies is so stunningly counterproductive and it must be said cruel. There is almost nothing worse than treating someone striving for competence as a tyrant in training. Victory in one of its primary and most socially important aspects is the overcoming of obstacles for the broader public good. Someone who's sophisticated as a winner wins in a manner that improves the game itself for all the players to adopt an attitude of naive or willfully blind cynicism about this or to deny outright that it is true. 
is to position yourself, perhaps purposely, as people have many dark motives, as an enemy of the practical amelioration of suffering itself. I can think of a few more sadistic attitudes. Now, power may accompany authority, and perhaps it must, however, and more important, genuine authority constrains the arbitrary exercise of power. This constraint manifests itself when the authoritative age, authoritative, I can't even say the word authoritative. Oh my God, you're on the cover. I've lost my place now. There it is. This constraint manifests itself when the authoritative, authoritative, <laughs> authoritative authoritative there we go authority authoritative agent cares and takes responsibility for those over whom the exertion of power is possible the oldest child can take accountability for his younger siblings instead of dom domineering over and testing and torturing them and can learn in the manner how to exercise authority and limit the misuse of power even the youngest can exercise appropriate authority over the family dog. To adopt authority is to learn that power requires concern and competence, and that it comes at a genuine cost. Someone newly promoted to a management position soon learns that managers are frequently more stressed by their multiple subordinates than subordinates are stressed by their single manager. Such experience moderates what might otherwise become romantic but dangerous fantasies about the attractiveness of power and helps quell the desire for its infinite extension. And in the real world, those who occupy positions of authority in functional hierarchies are, general struck, are generally struck to the core by the responsibility they bear for the people they supervise, employ, and mentor. Not everyone feels this burden, of course. A person who has become established as an authority can forget his origins and come to, come to develop a counterproductive contempt for the person who is just starting out. This is a mistake, not least because it means that the established person cannot risk doing something new, as it would mean adopting the role of a despised fool. It is also because arrogance bars the path to learning. Short-sighted, willfully blind, and narrowly selfish tyrants certainly exist, but they are by no means in the majority, at least in functional societies. Otherwise, nothing would work. The authority who remembers his or her sojourn, 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 sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, the authority who remembers his or her sojourn as voluntarily beginner by contrast can retain their identification with the newcomer and the promise of potential and use that memory as the source of personal information necessary to constrain the hunger for power. One of the things that has constantly amazed me is the delight that Decent people take in the ability to provide opportunities to those who, over whom they currently exercise authority. I have experienced this repeatedly personally as a university professor and researcher, and observed many other people in my situation doing the same. And in the business and other professional settings I have become familiar with, there is a great intrinsic, intrinsic pleasure in helping already competent and admirable young people become highly skilled, socially valuable, autonomous, responsible professionals, it is not unlike the pleasure taken in raising children and is one of the primary motivators of valid ambition. Thus, the position of top dog which occupied properly has one of its fundamental attractions, the opportunity to, do, to identify deserving individuals at or near the beginning of their professional life and provide them with the means of a productive advancement. Okay, so let's end the, that part there. Okay. Okay, okay, good. So I do like what he's trying to say is that employ the people who know how to give authority to... So basically what he's trying to say is give authority to the people who can solve the problem. Hands down, absolutely correct. Absolutely downtown correct. That is amazing. That's one of the best answers I've ever heard in my life. Uh, the question is obviously... People can solve the problem of the first people who can have the experience. But the question is not the whole chapter is about, <clears throat> no, I mean, rule one is about, about the fool, right? Um, basically, one has to be full, a beginner, in order to become an expert. And so, interesting enough, I think, you know, as things are coming together. It does make sense that, okay, he in the beginning, he's not the one who should be an authority, right? The fool must not be an authority, but... Later on in his life, he will have the authority because now he knows. So it does make sense. It would, I mean, it really does uh, make complete sense to do that. And and he's talking about how in the hierarchies, 
you know, there are people that are definitely mad men who want power and who will have sinister um, goals. And that's an interesting uh, view on things is that if there were many of them, the, the whole hierarchy would, you know, drown. I think that it's very true because look at it, look at America, look at it, look at uh, England, look at it, look at, you compare the, the sinister leaders or in somewhat close to, you know, uh, evil or close to, oh, let's not, I don't say evil, more like evil intentions. I don't think they're evil. I think they maybe have the wrong idea, but because of, you know, the experience and how they grow, that one, I'm, that's a good counter argument. Um, what I've realized is that he's trying to say, yeah, okay, the most, the ones that who have, you know, kind of pe people who have evil intentions, those hierarchies tend to fall. And I think that's been proven throughout history. But the question is, you know, what I've learned is with Peterson is that he, 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 he can see what's evil. He, he deciphers what's evil is, right? Like Hitler, oh, he's the most evil, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. He is the most evil, right? Let's say that. I'm not going to say not. I, 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 let me say that out loud. Don't freaking clip me. All right. What I'm saying is listen. You got to listen. People are human beings. All right. In history. All right. What am I saying? People were fucking nuts. Okay. They were crazy. They didn't know better. They didn't understand life. Okay. They didn't understand people around them had you know, the same consciousness, the same human brains, they all, to those people, everybody was a threat because they wanted to survive graciously. I'm not saying Hitler, no, nope, not that. I'm just saying, how do, how do we know what's evil? You know, is, okay, well, like, people, sick people tend to be evil. Dark colors tend to be evil. You know, like as in the color patterns, if you look at art, you see what black, you know, demons, etc. Those tend to be evil. Like those darknesses, are, are, that is what is described ill-intentioned, as we would say. But my question is, like, some people are raised in a certain way to believe that is not, you know, ill-intentioned. But in society today, we discovered well, maybe throughout that we thrive with more people. And so that becomes what is good intention. So I had this theory in my head is that a lot of people decipher what is survivability in a whole, right? So the more survival, that equals more good. So the, if the intention is good for the group, for of, to keeping everybody alive, like let's say there's one person who has a disease, right? And there's a tribe. They have to kill this person. Therefore, that's not evil, right? Because in order for the whole tribe to survive, they can't be near the virus in order to thrive. So you murder the person, burn them, etc. He could survive, but they will murder him because of the threat. So that's what I'm saying is like, what is evil <laughs> Evil in, to, in, in, in terms of in language, right? We, when you raise a kid, a monster is evil. That means from the very beginning, He's terrifying, uh, ill, he chooses ill choices, he wants to create violence, wants to be loud, wants to be terrifying. That is, is what we learn to be evil. So something as a threat to our own survivability. This is the interesting part because I don't ever see him talk about what is evil in a sense, right? But what I think evil intends to mean is threat to to our to our our lives. So anything that is a threat to our lives is considered evil. Um, but again, then, you know, I'm, you know, he's talked about, you know, the World War II, right? So I've seen him talk about, you know, the German Nazi stuff, right? He's like, oh my God, that was obviously, that's fucked up. Jeez, no one, you know, I totally agree. This guy was totally evil, right? But the question is what some, you see, the, the propaganda drove these ideologies to believe that, you know, this has to happen uh, and, you know, to murder these people because they were a threat to society. Do you, do you see what I'm trying to say is that what they what is going on is that groups tend to, if they are given a belief, they will act upon on what they believe is going to keep them alive and 
you know, tend to from what they believe will make them thrive and alive to survive, right? right? So that's what I'm saying is that what tends to be evil in everybody's eyes, and once you see that information, is the, the thing that threatens you. So that that's what tends to threaten life in general. Is that it's either it's it, 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 it's it's the, defined as death. The, something that encourages death. That is what is evil. That is what I think. If if I was you know debating, he's like, what is evil? What is evil? What is good and evil, etc. Because you know he discusses like, okay, um, you know, a hero can be violent, right? He can be protected. He can this shoot. He can do violent things, but he tends to choose the other. He tr tr prevents the violence. That's his whole point. So he's. I like that. That's what he talks about the hero, but he never talks about the evil because the whole thing is that that he doesn't define it. And a lot of people say, oh, he's evil, you know, he, but no one tends to understand what it means. And if you look at it from a objective base, it just means something that threatens the entirety of life. And so that is, that is what would be considered evil in my perspective and what he talks about. Um, yeah, but that is interesting. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, yeah, make sure you watch the whole video and when I talk about what is evil, etc. And I don't know, I think that's an interesting, I went from, you know, from authority to that concept. And it really, you know, sparked a, an idea in my mind about what he thinks of, you know, I'm trying to start to understand how he thinks, etc. And so I'm just adding some stuff there because... When I watch him, I'm inspired. Not in, but he's got some good stuff. Talks about, it. but there are certain things that comes and goes where he's like, oh, maybe, maybe he's not sure. Like, he's a psychologist. Maybe staying in lane. I don't know. Is he the authoritative guy to do this? Let's see. You know what I mean? But like, he's not a doc. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not gonna say anything. But let's see. I'm not criticizing guy. I'm just saying. Uh, my view is is that the one thing I have a problem with Jordan is that the nutrition thing, right? You can't just eat meat, right? You can't. Meat uh, is stupid because your body needs carbohydrates. It needs water. Like, I'm not saying eat bread. Eat more vegetables. Eat more nutritious meals, salads, and tomatoes, rice, I mean, var varieties of things, because if too much of it, like in my, in my own mind and my philosophy of life or my advice for life is balance is required. So you need something to keep you stable and healthy. If you want to be completely healthy, then you should just be eat extremely nutritious and avoid any fast food and any breads, to be frank, just rice, uh, vegetables, anything raw, raw, like that has been grown out of the ground and not processed, that is what I consider nutritious. So the most healthy thing would be that, but just, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is that maybe, you know, psychologist specializes, I'm not saying he can't learn other things, sure, maybe he learned something and maybe we can learn through it. Things keep him updating in, few, in the future, uh, which is interesting, and things changes over time. So I'm not saying he can't, you know, say you should eat like this. What I'm saying is, that maybe do some more research and then get an expertise to prove your point and then you can say okay a bunch of said we have this like like he did with the rat thing he took an article showed it saw the result and that that's a proven statement and i think that's a way to make an argument about the nutrition so those types of arguments that he brings up sometimes can be you know you, you need like prove with evidence is my point so that's the whole thing anyway thanks for watching that was part three. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, yeah, enjoy. I'm going to keep on going. Hopefully that was entertaining. <laughs> but yeah, cheers. Really, you know, like, comment, subscribe. You know the whole jab. <laughs>